Hello everyone, I am Deepak Chandrapal from the Department of Geological Sciences, Jadapur University, Kolkata. I will be discussing about sulfur isotopes, its natural variations and fractionations during different geological processes. I will also touch upon some selected applications of sulfur isotope in understanding geological process. You know sulfur is the 16th element in the periodic table and it is the 10th, 8th and 12th abundant element in the solar system in the bulk earth and in the continental crust. It has four stable isotopes, sulfur 32, 33, 34 and 36. Amongst this, sulfur 32 is the most abundant isotope which is about 95.02 percent in abundance followed by sulfur 34 which is about 4.25 percent in abundance. And these two stable isotopes of sulfur 32 and 34 are more com most commonly used to understand the geological processes. One important thing about sulfur is that it occurs in multiple oxidation states starting from plus 6 in sulfate to minus 2 in H2S or HS minus and there are several intermediate oxidation states. And as sulfur ox uh, occurs in different oxidation states, it is stable in different geological environment starting uh, I mean geological environment including in the atmosphere, hydrosphere and biosphere. So that is one reason why sulfur isotope is so important in understanding geological processes and at the same time the sulfur isotope fractionations become very complex because of its occurrences in uh, several oxidation states. So before we get into the details of sulfur isotope studies, let us have some idea about the some definitions of, uh, related to sulfur isotope studies. Now the first one is fractionation factor which is known as alpha and this alpha is defined as the ratio of the heavier by lighter isotope between two coexisting phases. Uh, quite commonly the isotopic composition of a phase is compared with respect to a standard or reference point and that is expressed at delta 34 in case of sulfur we call the delta 34 S which is actually the 34 by 32 sulfur ratio in a phase A minus 34 by 32 sulfur in a reference material divided by 34 by 32 S in the reference material. And these values are called are uh, uh, expressed in terms of parts per mil or parts per thousand. Uh, the reference material often um, used is canon diablo trilite which is a, a iron sulphide found in the canon diablo meteorites in Arizona. However, uh, recently this canon diablo trilite has been replaced by VCDT which is Vienna canyon diablo trilite. Uh, in case of two coexisting phases, the sulfur isotope ratio I mean differences between isotopic ratios of two uh, samples are known as relative enrichment factor. And these relative enrichment factors, the fractionation factors, they are related by this different uh, equations. Now this fractionation factor alpha in most of the cases is close to 1 particularly when the fractionation is taking place at a high temperature. So therefore if alpha tends to 1, then alpha minus 1 tends to 0 and when alpha minus tends to uh, 0, then ln alpha tends to 0. Therefore, in such cases, the, uh, the equation can be actually expressed by or the summarized as and uh, the relative enrichment factor can be rewritten as 10 q ln alpha by replacing alpha minus 1 by ln alpha. Now these alpha values are actually temperature dependent and in isotopic uh, fractionations, the temperature dependent alpha factors are often expressed as A by T square plus B by T uh, plus C, uh, where A, B and C are experimentally determined values. Now let us have a look on the uh, variations in the sulfur isotopic compositions in nature. Now the variations in the sulfur isotopic composition in nature is expressed in the same way as that of the other isotopes. So they are represented by the del 34 as values. Now here is a figure where the del 34 as values are plotted uh, in this axis, x axis and this is the positive direction, this is the negative directions. There are few important things that you can see from this figure is that first of all the meteorites, the basic seals and the mid oceanic ridge basalts, all of them has values close to 0. 
whereas the modern seawater has a very restricted composition of, of, of around plus 20. So, it appears that these two samples or the reservoirs they actually represent two end member compositions. And there are two more things which is to be noted, one is that the sulphide uh, the isotopic composition of the sulphides is often or uh, almost always much less than that of the coexisting sulphates in different sulphides uh, in the different sulphide deposits. Also the volcanic gas or volcanic H2S that has a negative value whereas the volcanic SO2 has a positive del 30 porous value and higher values compared to the volcanic H2S. Um, the sedimentary sulphide has a huge range covering almost the entire range of negative and positive values. Now, these extreme variations in the sulfur acidic compositions indicates that there must be some processes uh, which has resulted in the isotopic compositions or variations in the isotopic compositions. So, meteorite and modern seawater appears to be the two end member isotopic compositions and maybe they are the two may, uh, the sources end member sources from which the sulfur isotopes or the sulfur has been recycled to generate this isotopic variations in nature. There are several mechanisms by which sulfur isotope can fractionate in nature. Now, we know that the stable isotope fractionations take place uh, due to this mass variations or these isotopic fractionations are actually mass dependent. Uh, besides the mass of the isotopes, there are other physical and chemical parameters for example, temperature and the ionic radii and the charges of the isotopes that also have important uh, control on the fractionation processes. In fact, the chemical parameters control the bond strength of, uh, the, of the isotopes with the anion or with the, with the ions with which they are actually attached. And higher the bond strength or the stronger the bond, the heavier isotopes are usually preferred in the, in the stronger bonds. Uh, for example, in case of sulfur isotopes, sulfate uh, in SO4, sulfur oxygen bond is much stronger than H2S, uh, hydrogen and sulfur bond in H2S. Therefore, in case of sulfur isotope fractionation between sulfate and H2S, heavier isotope goes to sulfate compared to that of H2S. Um, as I have said, there are different, different uh, uh, processes by which sulfur isotope fractionates in nature. But I have already mentioned that magmatic water or the magmatic source, they have a distinct isotopic composition and, and represent an end member isotopic composition. Similarly, sea water also represent an end member isotopic composition. So, I will talk about the isotopic fractionations during the magmatic processes as well as during the reduction of sea water sulphate. Now, during the process of partial melting of a, of a rock, maybe in the mantle of the upper crust, the temperature is extremely high, so the fractionation is expected to be negligible or there would be no fractionation. And when the um, uh, minerals precipitate from this melt, again the temperature is very high, so therefore we will not expect any fractionation to, to take place between the mineral and the melt. However, when there is fluid saturation, that means with increasing crystallization, when the melt becomes saturated with fluid, then there is a chance of uh, sulfur isotope fractionations. For example, at temperature higher than 400 degrees centigrade, H2S and sulfur dioxide dominate in a hydrothermal fluid. So, the total isotopic composition that is delta 34S fluid is equal to delta 34S of H2S into XH2S, where XH2S is the mole fraction of H2S plus delta 34S SO2 into XH2S. So, clearly, clearly during these processes, the mole fractions or the mole ratio uh, plays a very important role in the sulfur isotope fractionations. And if the sulfur in the melt occurs mainly in the form of HS minus or SH minus and the uh, species in the fluid is mainly H2S, uh, the reduced species in the, in the form of H2S, then the isotopic fractionation can be expressed by this reaction. Uh, relation. So, again all these uh, relations suggest that the isotopic composition would depend on the mole fractions of the species present in the fluid at that point of time. In this case, we are talking about two fluids, one is H2S dominated or H2S fluid and the other one is sulfur dioxide fluid or sulfur dioxide species. Now, 
what will happen when a fluid is actually uh, actually being released or exhaled from a magma. Here is a diagram where you can see the temperature versus log activity of oxygen uh, uh, with respect to this basaltic magma and the rhyolitic or dacitic magma. And note this solid line where which is actually SO2 H2S boundary above which SO2 is stable and below which H2S is stable. Uh, what you can see here is that basalt lies mostly below the SO2 H2S line which means if a fluid is derived from a basaltic melt it will be dominated by H2S and as it is dominated by H2S uh, okay, remember that in the melt the sulphur species occurs mostly as Hs minus and if the fluid is dominated by H2S then fractionation would take place between H2S by SH minus or Hs minus, but there is practically uh, no fractionation between SH minus and Hs minus. The reason is the bond strength of sulphur and hydrogen in H2S and sulphur and hydrogen in Hs minus are very similar. So, no practical, practically no fractionation takes place at this point of time. In case of a uh, rhyolitic magma, a uh, large part of this magma or some of the magma lie above this SO2 H2S line, whereas some magma lies below the SO2 H2S line. Now, if the magma composition uh, lies below the SO2 H2S line, that means if the melt is more reduced in nature containing more of H2S, uh, uh, then the fluid which is being exhaled from this melt will behave in a similar fashion as that of the fluid which is coming out of a basaltic melt. However, if it lies above the SO2 H2S line, then the fluid which will be exhaling from that melt will be SO2 dominated. Now, the sulfur in the melt occurs as Hs minus, whereas sulfur in the fluid occurs as SO2. Now, SO2 uh, has, has a preference for the heavier isotopes, so where Hs minus has a preference for the lighter isotope compared to SO2. So, there is expected to be huge fractionation. But this will depend on uh, important thing which is the volume fraction of the fluid which is being generated. If a large volume of fluid is being generated at this point, then most of the sulphur that was occurring in the melt will go out in the fluid and all the sulphur that was occurring in the melt will be transported in the fluid. So, the fluid will carry the isotopic composition of the melt. Uh, so, there will not be any change in the isotopic composition of the fluid in the uh, of the sulphur in the in the fluid. However, if the volume of that fluid is low, then the sulphur occurring in the melt will not be completely transferred to the fluid and therefore, whatever sulphur dioxide occur in the fluid will have a, uh, I mean there will be a strong fractionation between the whatever sulphur dioxide present in the fluid and the Hs minus in the melt. So, the SO2 in that case will be enriched in heavier isotope. So, del the delta 34 S of sulfur dioxide will be higher than the delta 34 S of H2S or Hs minus in the melt. During the precipitation of minerals, sulphide minerals from a, uh, from a hydrothermal fluid as we have just discussed now, uh, we will need H2S because H2S reacts with the metals to form the sulphide minerals. So, it is important for us to understand what is the isotopic composition of H2S in a, in a hydrothermal fluid derived from a magma. So, this is again a plot where um, I mean in uh, between temperature versus log activity plot. Here uh, similar to the previous diagram I have plotted this SO2 by H2S line above which SO2 is stable below which H2S is stable. Now, during the evolution of a fluid uh, with decreasing temperature the fluid uh, may maintain its SO2 by, by H2S ratio or the SO2 by H2S ratio may change by, by variable reactions. For example, if a SO2 H2S varying fluid reacts with FeO or iron plus in the rock, then SO2 will be reduced to form H2S and the SO2 H2S ratio will decrease. So, there are similar other reactions by which we can change the SO2 by H2S ratio. Now, if the fluid was initially in the H2S dominated field and it remains in the H2S dominated field, there will not be any fractionation with decreasing temperature and even if there is a fractionation that will be very little. However, if this fluid crosses the SO2 H2S line, then 
H2S will be gradually converted to sulfur dioxide or SO2 and as we know that sulfur dioxide prefers the heavier isotope and as we generate more of SO2 then the heavier isotopes which are initially contained in H2O sorry H2S that will be transferred to SO2. So basically sulfur dioxide will snatch the heavier isotope from H2S and this will result in a decreasing del 34S value of remaining H2S. Now if the fluid uh, lies initially in the sulfur dioxide dominated field that is above this line and if the SO2 H2S ratio does not change then still then there will be there, there will be uh, fractionation with, with decreasing temperature. So the H2S uh, will be gradually be depleted in, in the heavier isotopes because as the temperature decreases we know the fractionation becomes more prominent. So sulfur dioxide again will take away the heavier isotopes from H2S and H2S will be gradually depleted in 34S resulting in uh, 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 lower del 34S value. Now if SO2 uh, the, if the fluid crosses the SO2 H2S boundary and moves to H2S towards the H2S field uh, this means that some of the sulfur dioxide will be converted to H2S and as the sulfur dioxide are being converted to H2S the heavier isotopes which are stuck in sulfur dioxide will now be taken up by H2S. So H2S will now uh, keep on gathering more of uh, sulfur 34 resulting uh, increase in the del 34S value of the H2S in the fluid. And so the as we can see that the del 34S value of H2S will change depending on the initial fluid composition as well as how the fluid evolves during its uh, decrease in the temperature and this will be certainly reflected in the composition of the minerals that precipitate by interacting with this H2S. Now let us have a look on how the, the fractionation takes place during the reduction of seawater sulphate to form H2S. Uh, seawater sulphate uh, can be reduced by two major processes. One is the bacterial sulphate redu uh, reduction which is BSR and the other one is thermochemical sulphate redu uh, reduction or TSR and this bacterial sulphate reduction actually takes place below the sediment water interface where the environment is anoxygenic and the bacteria like desulfovibrio or desulfuricans uh, is one of the common agent which helps in the fractionation or bacteriogenic fractionation of uh, seawater sulphate during its reduction. The CH2O I am sorry, the CH2O shown here actually represent the genetic organic matter. Now the fractionation of sulphur isotope during seawater sulphate reduction by bacteria will depend on whether the system was open or closed. Now if the system is closed, for example, if the sediment water interface lying below the water table is somehow isolated from the seawater then that will not be replenished by seawater sulphate. So the system will be close to sulphate. Now if there is no mechanism to mechanism to consume the H2S which has been produced uh, by the reduction of seawater sulphate. So H2S uh, will, not be, will not be taken up by any other things and the common mechanism by which H2S can be actually consumed is uh, the, the reaction of H2S with the, with the metals forming the metal sulphides or the loss of H2S in the overlying water column or formation of some organometallic complexes or organic complexes. So if there is no such mechanism is present then H2S will not be consumed and the system will be close to both SO4 and H2S and in this case very soon the H2S and SO4 will reach to an equilibrium. So this will be an equilibrium fractionation process and the isotopic composition of H2S will depend largely on the, uh, on, the, uh, the, on the H2S by SO4 ratio and the isotopic composition will be highly skewed and the sulphides precipitating from such a solution will have a very restricted, uh, restricted isotopic composition. Now in other case where for example the system is close to seawater 
seawater sulfate. That means seawater sulfate is not being able to be uh, to, to replenish the zone of uh, seawater sulfate re uh, reduction below the water table, uh, whereas the H2S is being consumed by the processes just I have mentioned. So, in this case, what will happen is that in the early stage, the, the, the H2S produced will have a strongly negative value because there is an extreme fractionation between SO4 and H2S. As I have just already mentioned, that sulfur, sulfate uh, takes in the heavier isotope and sulfides takes in the lighter isotope. So, uh, the, the whole process can be expressed by Rayleigh fractionation in which the early form sulfides will have a strongly negative value. But as the process goes on, as the process goes on, the residual sulfate will be uh, extremely enriched in, in heavier isotopes and the later sulfides which will precipitate or the later H2S which will be produced from this highly enriched H, uh, highly enriched sulfate will also have a positive values, delta T porous values. So, the minerals which will precipitate from this H2S at a later stage will have a positive delta T porous value and uh, this will not be as cute as in case of closed system, uh, closed system sulfur isotope fractionation or sulfur isotope reduction to sulfides. And there is another process which is known as thermochemical sulfate reduction. In fact, there are many geological processes uh, where or there are many, uh, there are many old deposits where the, there are evidence that bacteria did not operate in those, in those cases. In fact, this, this uh, sulfate reducing bacteria that operate mostly in the temperature range of 20 to 40 degrees centigrade, but there are many deposits which form at a much higher temperature where bacteria cannot survive. So, sulfate reduction in those places takes place by, by inorganic processes, but in the presence of organisms uh, which do not, which just help in the, which just help in the reduction of the, or the, of the sulfates. And in many cases, it is observed that this reduction process operates uh, with, a, with the formation of an intermediate sulfur species. For example, it has formed sulfur here and this sulfur further in the presence of, um, in the presence of organic matters can uh, convert it to H2S. So, it is not a direct reduction of sulfate to sulfide, it is a reduction of sulfate to sulfide through uh, intermediate stage of maybe sulfur or some other intermediate um, states of, I mean species of sulfur. So, as there are intermediate species formations, so these processes do not result in extensive fractionation of sulfur isotopes during the reduction process. Um, in some cases, seawater sulfate also gets reduced when it, it, it reacts with iron plus 2 in phyolite or magnetite uh, during the journey of the seawater through the cracks in the mid oceanic ridges. Uh, there are a lot of mafic rocks uh, uh, where uh, there are plenty of phyolites and magnetites when the seawater passes through this, this mafic rocks, they can interact with iron in, in uh, plus 2 oxidation state and can, they can be reduced to form H2S. Again, these sort of processes are usually, they usually reach to equilibrium very often or very soon and therefore, not much of fractionation is seen in, in thermochemical sulfate reductions unlike the bacteriogenic sulfate reduction. Uh, now, let us uh, discuss about some of the applications of sulfur isotopes. So, I will first talk about the mass independent fractionation and its implication in early atmospheric oxygenations. Uh, we have discussed that sulfur isotope fractionations are usually mass dependent. Now, if the fractionations are mass dependent, then there should have some relation between delta 33 S and delta 34, uh, 34 S. Uh, now, delta 33 S is actually the similar thing as that of the delta 34 S. The only difference is that uh, in the place of 34 sulfur, 33 sulfur is, is used and here 33 by 32 sulfur ratio is used. Here we use 34 by 32 sulfur ratio and here we use 36 by 32 sulfur ratio. Now, if there is MIF, then the delta 33 S value should be about half that of delta 34 S value because the mass difference between 32 and 30. Uh, 3 is 1, whereas the mass difference between 34 and 32 is 2. Uh, so, the in exact, uh, I mean exactly it should happen that delta 33, delta 33 S value should be about 0.515 into 
delta 34 s whereas, the delta 33, uh, 36 s should be equal to 1.90 into delta 34 s, but this is not the case in many in uh, geological environments. Uh, ideally as I have just said ideally the if there is m i f then the samples in a plot of delta 34 s versus delta 33 s the samples should plot on a linear array. The this array actually define a line which is delta 33 s is equal to 0.514 into delta 34 s and this linear array is known as mass dependent fractionation line. However, in many Archean samples it is observed that the samples the, 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 the samples in the similar plot they do not fall on this linear array not uh, or, or they do not plot on the mass dependent fractionation line they plot on the either side of this MFL or the mass fractionation line mass dependent fractionation line. So, there must be a reason behind this. Now, what is the quantum of these sort of fractionations? The quantum of the fractionations are actually ex expressed by a cap delta 33 s and cap delta 33 uh, 36 s. Now, what cap delta 33 s is? This is the difference between the delta 33 s which is obtained from the sample minus 0 0.515 into delta 34 s which is actually expected for a m uh, mass dependent fractionations. Similarly, cap delta 36 s is expressed as delta 36 s minus 1.90 into delta 34 s. Uh, there are some recent studies in which it is observed that in rocks which are older than uh, 2400 million years there the cap delta 33 s which should be actually 0 if there is mass dependent fractionation this cap delta 33 s values they fluctuate and they have a, a huge negative and positive value starting from about 2.0 to minus 2. Uh, so, clearly these samples are not the results of mass dependent fractionation. Now, from the from the 2400 to about 2000 million years we see some little bit of fractionations uh, the, the values they uh, straddle uh, around this 0 value, but still there are some, some uh, variations in the delta 33 s value, but in rocks younger than 2000 million years the almost all the samples uh, and there are in fact more samples to show this that they fall on this delta 33 s uh, is equal to 0 line. So, what is the possible explanation for this? Now, up till now there has been only one explanation in experimental studies it has been observed that the ultraviolet ray when it interacts with sulfur dioxide it produces uh, it produces sulfur monoxide and oxygen and the sulfur monoxide can again break into sulfur and oxygen. Now, during this photolysis of sulfur dioxide by ultraviolet frame having a wavelength of 190 to 220 nanometer this sulfur dioxide attains a cap delta 33 s value less than 0, whereas the sulfur monoxide that attains a cap delta 33 s value of more than 0. Uh, so, this is the only experiment uh, in which it has been observed it has been shown that ultraviolet rays can do the job uh, by photolysis of sulfur dioxide producing two different cap delta 33 s values one for sulfur dioxide and another for sulfur monoxide. Now, if the sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere, if there was abundant sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere, in fact, uh, in the modern day sulfur dioxide are being added to the atmosphere through the magmatic activity, volcanic activities. So, there is enough reason to believe that sulfur dioxide was lofted to the atmosphere in the early earth as well. And if there was sulfur dioxide, then if uh, and this sulfur dioxide. Uh, might have been in, might have interacted with the ultraviolet ray to form uh, the this sort of variations wherein the the sulfur uh, dioxide attains a negative value and the sulfur monoxide attains a positive value. Now, if this sort of variations took place due to the ultraviolet ray after the formation of sulfur dioxide this sulfur dioxide could have added uh, could have combined with the oxygen to form sulfite and this sulphide 
after combining with H2O would have formed H2SO4. And once this H2SO4 is formed, that will come down with the rain and become a part of the hydrosphere. And in the hydrosphere, these sulphates or the sulfidic acids or whatever form they are, they can form these sulphate minerals, for example, barite. Whereas, the sulphur produced or the sulphur particles which are produced by these photolysis reactions, this particulate sulphur again may come down to the earth surface and be a part of the sulphide minerals. So, the sulphide minerals are expected to, to carry the, the uh, positive values whereas, the sulphates which are formed from the sulphur dioxide uh, are expected to carry a negative cap delta 33 as well. Now, the question is, uh, so what is the implication of this? What is the implication or interpretation of this, this sort of observations? So, uh, it is important to note that the ultraviolet ray having a wavelength of 190 to 220 nanometer is absorbed by largely by ozone and partly by molecular oxygen. So, if this ultraviolet ray has to be present in the early atmosphere, then the ozone must be absent in the early atmosphere, because the presence of ozone will absorb this ultraviolet ray and there will not be any ultraviolet ray available to uh, photolyse, uh, photolyse this SO2 and cause this MIF signature. So, um, the ozone must have been absent, uh, ozone layer must have been absent during that time. Uh, and we know that ozone is formed by molecular oxygen. And if ozone has to be absent, molecular oxygen has to be has to be absent in the early atmosphere. So, this is a strong indication of um, the early anoxic or low oxygenation oxygenated atmosphere in the early Archean. In fact, there are several parallel lines of evidences which indicates the early atmosphere was anoxic. Um, and the anoxic atmosphere which prevailed up to almost 2400, then the atmosphere started becoming oxygenated and from about 2000 million years, the atmosphere became almost as oxygenated as, it, as we see it today. So, uh, this is how the sulphur isotopic studies can help us to understand the early oxygenation in the atmosphere. And uh, there are another applications. For example, uh, the isotopes can be applied to understand hydrothermal ore deposits. Uh, in fact, some of the questions that we ask in understanding hydrothermal ore deposit is that, what is the temperature of mineral precipitation? So, uh, let us have a look on this, on this figure, which is the uh, uh, 1000 uh, uh, 10 cube ln alpha of the different species with respect to H 2 S uh, and the this is variations with temperatures. So, for example, this this line means that the 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 alpha or the fractionation between sulphate and H 2 S dependent on the temperature. Similarly, this line uh, indicates the uh, uh, the fractionation, uh, the, the dependence of the fractionation factor on temperature of lead S PBS with respect to H 2 S. Now, uh, if we have the sulphide minerals and the coexisting H 2 S, so from these fractionation factors we can directly find out the temperature, but in a mineral deposit we do not have the H 2 S present, we only have the sulphide minerals. So, to find out the temperature of the sulphide mineral crystallization, we need to know the fractionation factors between two sulphide minerals for example, galena, PBS and for example, ZNS. Now, it is not a very difficult one to do this, this can be exercised like we know the alpha values fractionation factors of say galena versus H 2 S and we also know the fractionation factors of um, galena or oh, sorry uh, spalerite versus H 2 S. So, from these uh, galena versus H 2 S fractionation factors, we can find out the uh, delta lead S uh, PBS values and similarly from delta Z N S value, uh, we can also obtain the, uh, the I mean express the delta Z N S value in terms of 10 q ln, ln alpha in Z N S versus H 2 S and doing this exercise, we can finally actually find out the delta Z N S minus delta PBS value in terms of alpha. ZNS versus H 2 S and alpha PBS versus H 2 S. Now, these are already experimentally determined. We know the temperature dependence as I have already shown 
this is um, JNS versus H2S. So, we know this temperature dependence of JNS versus H2S and this one this uh, PBS versus H2S and we also know this PBS versus H2S from these figures. So, these are all known and these values we can obtain from the samples we are studying. So, using these equations we can find out the temperature dependent fractionation factor of the different sulphide minerals and from that we can find out the temperature. Now, the next application is the, 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 the composition of the, of the sweets um, that uh, precipitated the minerals. Now, the, now the isotopic compositions um, of H2S and SO4 in a sweet can be obtained from the fractionation factors. For example, if I know the isotopic composition of pyrite and if I know the fractionation factor between pyrite and H2S, then uh, knowing the temperature, the isotopic composition of H2S can be obtained. Similarly, the isotopic composition of SO4 in the fluid can be obtained. But please remember that just getting the isotopic composition of H2S in the fluid uh, during the precipitation of the mineral or for that matter, getting the isotopic composition of sulphate in the fluid during its precipitation of the sulphate minerals will not give us the isotopic composition of the overall fluid. So, what we need in that case is that the molar proportions of H2S and SO4 and also know the pH values and the, and the, the oxygen or sulphur fugacity during the precipitation of sulphide minerals. There are different ways to know that, but it is not a very easy task, but still we can find out these values uh, the, the particularly the molar ratios of different uh, I mean H2S versus SO4. For example, uh, in the absence of uh, for example, if the, the mineralization in the mineralization uh, we, we find that pyrotide is present as a stable phase and the temperature is less than 500 degrees centigrade, then in such a situation H2S is expected to be the main or practically the only, only, only sulphur species in the fluid and in those cases del 34S of the fluid would be actually equal to the del 34S uh, sorry delta 34S uh, of the fluid will be actually the delta 34S of the H2S that we can, uh, we can obtain from the fractionation factors and the delta 34S values of the sulphide minerals. Now, there is another applications, uh, I will just complete uh, my presentations uh, with this uh, another important applications. Um, here the delta 34S of H2S is plotted against the delta 34S of sulphate or the, the coexisting sulphate. Now, if these two minerals, uh, uh, if the sulphides and the sulphate minerals, they precipitated from a equilibrium state or they were in equilibrium, then they should fall along a particular line in this x y plot. For example, if the fluid had only uh, on, uh, had only H2S, that means the sulphate was 0, that is the fluid was completely composed of H2S, then the values of delta 34S H, H2S, that means the sulphides, by the by H2S I mean the sulphides here and so forth, I mean the, the sulphate, uh, 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 sorry these are the sulphides and these are the sulphates. So, they will fall along this line, uh, whereas if the fluid contain only sulphate, uh, and no H2S, then they will be plotted along this line. Uh, in, uh, in for any other uh, compositions or for any other sulphate by sulphate ratio, the values will be plotted uh, along some lines in between these two horizontal and vertical lines. And as an example, this is the line which is a 45 degree line along which this SO4 by H2S ratio is actually 1. Uh, when these lines are they are extended to the zero fractionation line that means SO4 minus H2S uh, cap delta SO4 minus H2S is equal to 0. So, when these values are extended to this line the intersection point gives the uh, uh, isotopic composition of the fluid. So, now to summarize there are extreme variability in the sulfur isotopic compositions of natural materials. One of the major reason behind this is the stability of sulfur or the occurrence of sulfur in multiple oxidation state which controls the bond strength and the bond strength controls the different fractionation processes involving sulfur. Uh, on top of it sulfur isotopic fractionations are also controlled by biotic and abiotic processes. So, 
uh, the resultants are of, uh, I mean uh, resulting in different compositions of sulfur isotopes in nature. However, still there are two major sources or the two major reservoirs of sulfur having distinct isotopic composition one is seawater and the other one is magma or the meteorites. Uh, and using these two end member compositions we can understand the sulfur isotopic variations in nature and sulfur isotopes can be very well used to understand different geological processes. One of the most important application of sulfur isotope is to understand the early atmospheric evolutions, uh, the oxygenation of the early atmosphere and most of the studies on the understanding of early atmospheric evolution involving isotopes or the stable isotopes has been done on or has been done including sulfur isotopes although there are some studies that include oxygen studies uh, oxygen stable isotope studies to understand the early oxygenation environment or early oxygenation in the atmosphere. Now sulfur isotopes are very useful to understand the ore forming processes particularly the hydrothermal processes but few things we need to remember. First of all we can get the temperature, we can get the fluid composition. However, this fluid composition is the composition of the fluid from which the mineral precipitates. It does not necessarily is the same fluid which has been derived from the source because we have discussed and described that during the process of fluid evolution for example, in case of magmatic fluid even if the original melt had the 0 delta 34 s value that can be modified during the evolution of the hydrothermal solutions. So, just having the acidity composition of the fluid we should not comment on the source of the fluid immediately to do so we need to have some idea about the geology of those areas, evolutionary history and geochemistry of the materials that we are working on. So, with that I thank you very much.